Hey guys, this is Eckhart Slaughter. Hello and welcome to another video. Today we will be talking about five of the most underrated starfighters in Star Wars history. Underrated can mean a variety of things. Either fans don't give it the recognition it deserves, or sometimes the ship is talked down to in lore when it really doesn't deserve to be. And now, these aren't really in any particular order, just five that come to mind. And we'll start first with actually the fighter that prompted me to begin this list. An amazing fighter that came out long after the Battle of Endor, the Mandalorian Besselic. This ship is so underrated by, I think, everyone that there's not even official art of it, but it's a major plot point for the legacy of the Force series. Basically what happens is that the Mandalorians find a new load of Beskar and they use it to armor a next generation of fighter known as the Besselic. The ship was well armed, it was very very hard to destroy, and it was extraordinarily fast. The downside was of course that because of its rare armor, it absolutely fetched a premium when it came to cost and the fighter was only in limited supply. Here's actually a quote speaking about the quality of the Besselic from Legacy of the Force Revelation. Corellia had placed an order for the Mandalorian's Besselic fighter. It was faster than an X-Wing, armored in virtually impregnable Mandalorian armor, and for sale to anyone who had the credits. It was one of those destabilizing things that changed the course of wars. And as that excerpt alludes to, this was basically during the Second Galactic Civil War, and factions across the galaxy were basically fighting for the ability to purchase the fighter. Anyway, despite the ship's importance and its seemingly amazing reputation and universe is something that I never really here talked about on Star Wars YouTube or just in generally among fans, so I wanted to mention it in this video. Next up, we have actually the complete opposite, a very famous starfighter that is actually derided in universe and out of universe. I'm talking about the Y-Wing. Now, was the Y-Wing showing its age a little bit by the end of the Galactic Civil War? Maybe a tad, but it was still an incredibly versatile fighter, and not one that could wholly be replaced by the B-Wing. And that was actually what the New Republic tried to do in Star Wars Legends. They wanted to phase out the Y-Wing entirely for the B-Wing, but the latter turned out to be difficult to produce, difficult to maintain, and I would argue not quite as useful in some situations as the Y-Wing. The Y-Wing also gets a lot of heat among pilots in, say, the Rogue Squadron books. Not as much as the TIE Bomber, but it's also not nearly as bad of a fighter, but I do think it's worth highlighting how the Y-Wing can be used, and funny enough, we actually see a good example in the Clone Wars. The Y-Wing was a phenomenal starfighter for the Rebel Alliance because it was perfect perfect at attacking Imperial targets. Unlike some fighters, which were just unwieldy, the Y-Wing still could move. It had decent speed and armor, but also had a huge payload. The Rebels used Y-Wings alongside X-Wings in hyperspace attacks. Basically, they would find Imperial target, they would launch their fighters from a few systems over, they would hit the target quickly, then leave. Certain Y-Wing variants also actually had that rear-facing gunner, allowing the ship to operate even more independently. It can actually fend off a opposing starfighters. You said the Essential Guide to Warfare describes the vehicle. Y-Wings could attack both ground targets and capital ships. The turreted ion cannon, originally designed to fight off vulture droids, could disable and capture freighters, making Y-Wings excellent commerce freighters. Powerful shields completed the design, allowing Y-Wings to absorb repeated hits from ties or even glancing blows from enemy cruisers. There weren't a whole lot of ships in the Rebel fleet that could do that. The rear-facing gunner and their decent straight-ahead speed and acceleration made the Y-Wing very dangerous in the middle of a space battle, especially when accompanied by friendly starfighters. All right, next up we have the droid tri-fighter, and this one is mostly on the list because I think people just don't understand quite how deadly this thing was. We get a really good look at the droid tri-fighter in the Revenge of the Sith novelization, and Anakin and Obi-Wan are really dogged by some of these things and nearly killed. The droid tri-fighter not only had an incredible design, but probably among the best programming ever used in any sort of battle droid. It's probably also the ultimate expression of a droid starfighter in my opinion because it uses one advantage that other fighters don't for whatever reason. It's very, very small. The droid tri-fighter is literally about half the length and width of an A-wing, a ship that is already remarkably tiny. What's more, the ship's gyroscopic core allows it to spin wildly, making the tri-fighter exceptionally difficult to hit even in the best of cases. However, this thing was not only very difficult to kill, but also very dangerous. It had one heavy laser cannon, three smaller light cannons, and could also launch ordnance and buzz droid. This thing was absolutely deadly. It had an incredible combination of firepower and speed. Obviously, it didn't have shielding, but the chances of you destroying this thing with 
its light speed reflexes are, well, not very good. All right, so we're gonna end this list with two Imperial fighters. First up is the TIE Interceptor. Now the TIE Interceptor is a weird one because it is exceedingly common in the Star Wars universe, but I think it's often lumped in with its lesser quality brother, the TIE Fighter. I think people sometimes conflate the TIE Interceptor's fragility with a lack of quality, and that's not the case at all. The TIE Interceptor was a very clear design choice by the Empire to make a top of the line Interceptor. Very, very light, very fast, and very, very deadly. For better or worse, the TIE Interceptor is always held up against the A-Wing, and it comes ahead in some areas and behind in others. The TIE Interceptor had a lower top speed than the A-Wing, but I would argue that in dogfights, which the TIE Interceptor is designed for, that's not necessarily the most important factor, and the TIE Interceptor does come ahead in terms of maneuverability, which I think is really key. There was a reason that Imperial Aces generally preferred TIE Interceptors as their choice of fighter, and it was because you were almost impossible to hit when flying that thing, especially when combined with the TIE Interceptor's very narrow target profile, again, just like the A-Wing. Now, unlike the Rebel counterpart, the TIE Interceptor had one single role. The A-Wing, in some situations, could be used to attack capital ships. A TIE Interceptor, not so much. This thing was armed literally with six laser cannons. Great for dogfighting, but that's pretty much it. Again, not necessarily a bad thing. The TIE Interceptor had a role, and all these design choices sort of fit into that. To be fair, there are other trade-offs. I've already mentioned some, but the TIE Interceptor also typically did not have shielding, although sometimes shields were installed, didn't have a hyperdrive. And yeah, the Empire probably could have spent more money on individual models, but with what they had to work with and having to scale the ship up and use it across the entire fleet, I think they came up with something that's pretty impressive. And the TIE Interceptor would have actually eventually replaced the TIE Fighter had the Battle of Endor not happened, and it was still well on its way. All right, our final ship is an appropriate one to talk about after the TIE Interceptor because we are on to the TIE Avenger. The reason why the TIE Avenger is sort of underestimated by Star Wars fans, I think, is because it is perhaps rightfully overshadowed by the TIE Defender, which can do pretty much anything. However, anyone who's ever played X-Wing Alliance will know these ships are still incredibly deadly, especially if you've messed around in the free play mode. Specification-wise, yeah, the TIE Avenger is outclassed in most areas by the Defender, but that's the case for pretty much every ship in Star Wars. Wars history. It was still faster than an A-Wing, just as maneuverable as a TIE Interceptor, was fully shielded, and also had a missile launcher. The trade-off for the missiles was the loss of those two forward-facing cannons that the Interceptor has on its cockpit, but I think the overall diversity, especially in a very expensive fighter like this, is worth it. I'm not going to talk too much about the TIE Avenger, I just think it needs a bit more attention. But guys, that's all I have for you today. Until next time, be safe, have a good one, and may the Force be with you.